What strange creatures we are. We have the ability to think and to create extraordinary technology and yet we are beings full of fear, full of sorrow, as well as great joy. We're divided among ourselves. We have a brain, a reptilian brain, at the base of our, right in the heart of our uh, cranium. Uh, we've inherited it from our reptilian ancestors, which is all about survival. It's said that this uh, brain, uh, the, the reptiles, have four, they, the, the, the neuroscientists call them devoted to the four Fs. Uh, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and uh, reproduction. <laughs> um, and, yet to, uh, and yet, too, we also have developed this uh, neocortex, which enables us to stand back from that, reflect, and create all the things we have created. And the worst things happen when that uh, reptilian brain gets married with our um, thinking brain uh, to create great harm in the world. Uh, we've developed technology able to wipe out our planet. And yet that's not all we are. We are also beings that have an imagination. Uh, we ha the imagination has been described by Jean-Paul Sartre as the ability to conceive of something that is not present. And uh, this, this has been the source of a great deal of our uh, progress. We've been able to imagine uh, something uh, is always better than what is present for us. We've been able to develop. Um, and uh, yet we can also imagine what is not yet present to us, the moment of our own death. We are beings that live with the knowledge of our own mortality in a way that I don't think, say, dogs, who are, I have a dog at home, uh, very much in the moment. They don't look before and they don't look after. Uh, we are constantly aware of our own extinction and have to live with that. And that can render so much of what we do meaningless. So we are meaning-seeking creatures, too. Uh, and if we fail to find some kind of significance in our lives, we can fall very easily into despair. And that is why, from the very beginning of human history, as far as we know it, um, we have created works of art at the same time as we've created uh, religions to give us some sense that despite all the depressing evidence to the contrary, our lives have some kind of meaning and value. And the two are linked, as we'll see, art and religion. Also, we, our minds, our human minds, have this extraordinary capacity to have ideas and experiences that can, that go beyond our conceptual grasp. Uh, we are con it's part of the human experience is that some elements of our experience of the world uh, can never be explained. We used to think that science was going to answer all our questions. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was thought that there were only a few outstanding problems left in the Newtonian system, and then we'd have, our understanding of the universe would be complete. 20 years later, you have quantum mechanics, Einstein, and an indeterminate universe. Uh, and we were back facing a universe that we could imagine, and yet we could not define. In, in, in any sort of uh, ordinary way. So we have this yearning for transcendence, for that which goes beyond our conceptual grasp. And uh, we have this yearning for meaning. And that's where we use our imagination and have done since 
uh, the dawn of recorded history to try to give our lives some ultimate significance and value. And art and religion are linked. Uh, religion, I see it as a form of art, as kind of art form. And that's only a derogatory uh, way of put, look, thinking about religion if you have a low opinion of art, uh, which I don't. I, I think that religion has always expressed itself best in terms of art, in poetry, in song, in uh, sculpture, in painting, in music, in dance, architecture. Uh, it's at its best when it expresses itself in terms of art. And it is not easy when it's expressed, tries to express its ideas in logical, rational, uh, sci quasi-scientific language. It's ill at ease in that it's the wrong genre for, for it. And that's what uh, I, I want to sort of focus on a little bit tonight. Um, let's go back, right back to the, one of the first recorded documents of human history. And I'm thinking, of course, about the great cave paintings uh, in uh, southern France and northern Spain. Some 300 or so decorated caves by our Paleolithic ancestors. I think the first uh, caves, the earliest caves, uh, were um, decorated some 30,000 years ago. Lascaux, the most famous, is a relative modern <laughs> uh, phenomenon. Uh, it was... It, it, they, 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 dated the first uh, uh, paintings and engravings in the Lascaux complex, the Lascaux labyrinth, date back only to a mere 17,000 years. In all these um, caves, you, uh, these extraordinary paintings, which in some way speak to us more immediately than the more sophisticated things that came after it, say in Mesopotamia or Assyria. Those depictions of the animals um, we've got, in the British Museum, we have a, a wonderful depiction from the Lascaux area about the same time of two swim, a, a carving about that big, of two swimming reindeer, one on top of the other. Uh, and there's a, it's displayed with a photograph of two swimming reindeer swimming like that. And the dedication and the uh, tenderness and the accuracy with which these reindeer are depicted with uh, minimal, imagine the desperate kind of existence of these people, and yet the love with which these things have been depicted are extraordinary, and you see it in those cave paintings too. Now, we don't know uh, what actual rituals were actually performed there. We have to say that we can only speculate. But if you look at... Uh, there, there are other pa cave paintings in Africa in a sort of similar way um, in, in Australia too and at the uh, lives of hunting people who like our Paleolithic ancestors in uh, Europe uh, were de entirely dependent upon the killing and eating of animals uh, before the invention of agriculture. And it, we know from the lives of, say, the pygmies or the, the people in, the, uh, in, in Australia uh, that they are dis extremely disturbed about the killing of animals. Um, they know they, it's a harsh necessity of life. They depend upon this for meat. And yet there is something wrong about it. When they, uh, dip, when they uh, prepare for a hunt, they live, put put themselves in a state of ritual purity for a while. Uh, they abstain from sex, and they are trained, the young boys are trained to kill in a sacred manner, uh, in a way that honors the animal. And when the animal is killed, they try in some sense, they have often a belief that the animal in being killed and sacrificed in this uh, holy way uh, will enjoy some posthumous life. Uh, they will often lay out the skeleton of, the, of, of their kill, uh, the inedible parts of it, the skeleton and the skin, 
uh, reassemble it, uh, as if recreating it. And sometimes they will take the excrement and the, um, and the blood of the animal and smear it on the walls of, the, of, of, of underground, in caves underground, to get returning the beast to the uh, underworld from which it came so that it may rise again. And in the Lascaux paintings, uh, there are traces of animal fat, animal excrement. As, and this could, as you know, perhaps speculatively, we can only speculate, have been a, uh, a ritual of restoration, a sense that there's something wrong in the world that we have to destroy each other, other, other beings in order to have life. So often art and religion begin with the sense that there is something wrong. And uh, these paintings, and this tells us something a great deal about both religion and art, are very hard won by. It's not just these caves, you just wander into them, like as I'd wander into the back there and then do a little drawing. Uh, in, the, they are deep in the earth. And at the beginning of your experience in most of these labyrinths, you go down uh, for a long time before you see a single painting and enter into a place where the sun has never shone and where the darkness is absolute, so absolute that it seems that any kind of orientation with the outside world, visitors say, is, is sort of obliterated. You are disoriented by this darkness. That's an important point. And then think of the effort of some of these labyrinths. Uh, you have to journey for a mile underground dangerously uh, before you get to the, to the first paintings or the central sanctuary. There's one uh, up in the Pyrenees where you had the, the, to get to the main hall, people had to crawl uh, for at least half a mile through a tunnel a foot high in pitch darkness. Uh, bef uh, feeling, and people who did this in, when these caves were discovered said the terror of this, the utter darkness, the feeling of the earth, are, you know, absolutely on the, pressing you down. And then you came into the main hall, and the, it felt like a liberation, and there were these extraordinary, not paintings in this instance, but engravings, including the engraving of a large half man, half beast, and uh, beings playing the flute, so dancing perhaps went on there. People dressed in animal skin. Uh, a sense that the animal and the, the hunter and its prey were one and the same. Um, so you're separating yourself in some sense from the world outside and learning to look and experience in a different way. And it's hard work. It's not just a question of wandering into a church and singing a couple of hymns or wandering into an art gallery looking and saying very nice to and having a, a, a cup of coffee. It's for the painters too who would have, to, we see these paintings far more clearly than the artists themselves who had to work with tiny flickering lights in this utter darkness perched in Lascaux we know on scaffolding. Uh, which you can see the marks that was let, this left in the wall. There's many things about these caves we shall never understand. But one of the things uh, that comes out if you look at the experience of the indigenous peoples today, the indigenous hunting peoples today, is a sense of great empathy. Let me just give you one example. Uh, in the Kalahari, uh, the, the, the wood is very scarce. And the uh, Bushmen can only use very flimsy bows and arrows, which can only graze the skin. So they anoint the arrows with a, a, a lethal poison, which kills the animal very slowly. And the hunter that kills the animal has to stay with the animal while it dies, perhaps over a period of two days, crying out when it cries shuddering when it shudders, participating in its death throes, showing that hunter and hunted are one and the same. So there's a sense here of tenderness, not dashing down to the supermarket and grabbing a piece of meat off 
the shelf, but a sense that the taking of life is a massive thing, and a sense of tenderness and that of hearts breaking with the sorrow of life. So you have transcendence, suffering, empathy, uh, hard work. Um, and then let's look, too, at another great foundational moment, ancient Greece, 5th century Athens, when drama, as we know it, comes into being in the great tragedies that were produced on the feast of Dionysus, god of transformation. Every year on this festival, as in a ritualized way, the great playwrights of Athens would produce trilogies, and the Greeks loved competition, and uh, they would compete with one another uh, to present these, uh, these plays, which put pain, human pain, on stage. And the chorus would often say to the audience, weep, now weep with this person. And the Greeks did weep. They weren't, weren't like a lot of Western men today, not Dutchmen, I'm sure, but uh, who uh, would gulp hard and wipe an embarrassed tear from the corner of their eye. Uh, they wept aloud because Greeks felt that weeping together created a bond between human beings. You saw men and women on the stage uh, going through an extremity of pain and agony perplexity, sorrow, the sorrow of life, instead of running away from it, well, you were made to confront it just again. Um, and uh, it was, this was not uh, an optional thing. Every uh, male citizen of Athens, it's a much debated question whether females were allowed there, um, but every, it was a, a, a duty and even prisoners were, uh, re released from jail from the day to attend the plays, which often presented in mythical form. Uh, they, they would present one of the old Greek myths, but changing it quite freely in order to present some of the dilemmas that Athens was going through at this present time. So it was, you could see it as a communal meditation. Uh, and when they wept together, Greek the audience felt they were not alone in their sorrow, their own private sorrow, their own private pain. Um, and um, again, compassion is there too. Uh, very often the, 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 the chorus would cry, weep for Heracles, who had in a fit of divinely inspired madness killed uh, his wife and children. Or Oedipus, a man who'd, who'd broken every taboo by sleeping with his mother, albeit unwittingly, and killing his father. Weep for this polluted man. And the tenderness, very often, with which Oedipus, who begins by being this clear-sighted, rational human being, suddenly starts with, within his blindness uh, and his extremity of sorrow, a tenderness comes into his speech. Uh, and uh, the first of these tragedies to come down to us is Aeschylus's The Persians. Um, just a few years before that, I think it's about seven years before, uh, the uh, Greeks, ha the Athenians, had defeated the Persians at the landmark battle of, naval battle of Salamis. But before they achieved that victory, the Persians had rampaged through Athens trashed the city, and destroyed all the beautiful new uh, buildings, uh, religious buildings and temples on the Acropolis, out, just out the holy, sit, the holy hill outside the city. And now Aeschylus asks the audience to weep for the Persians. He presents the battle of Salamis from the Persians' point of view. And the Persians are presented as a people in mourning, Xerxes, the defeated hero of Salamis, is escorted with great dignity into his palace. And uh, it's said that the Greeks and Persians are sister peoples. Uh, they, they equal in dignity. No gloating, no triumph. Um, but 
a little bit of self-questioning. And once the, the ghost of Darius, the great emperor who first invaded uh, the Greeks, uh, he comes on and says he, he, he made a mistake. He was guilty of hubris, of overweening pride in going beyond the bounds divinely set for his empire. But uh, Aeschylus is making a point that many of the Athenians would have picked up, that at this point, Athens was beginning to behave in the same way, was beginning to uh, use the Delian League, which had been built up as a way to unite the cities of Greece against Persia, uh, to force them into an Athenian empire, and was also guilty of hubris. So you have self-questioning too. Are we doing the right thing? Art and religion should make you question everything you stand for uh, and uh, make you experience, the, stretch your sympathies to the utmost. This morning I went to the wonderful exhibition at the Hermitage. And there you see uh, the, the artists pushing us to see things in a different way, to see things from two different perspectives at the same time, to take a, uh, a, a little girl uh, in a black dress sitting and you're seeing the mystery of that girl. And when you leave such an exhibition, we should come out thinking, looking at things in uh, a different way. Um, and again, art and religion uh, both require a, the, the hard work, a change of vision. And look how we often use the same kind of terminology in both spheres. Uh, we use the term, uh, you know, vision. Of, uh, we use the term uh, inspiration, interpretation. These are cognate things as we struggle to make sense of our tragic existence. And yet, in a moment of tenderness, it, uh, we, we, we break the bounds of e the egotism that holds us in thrall and learn to reach out to others, even our enemies, erstwhile enemies, and gain new freedom, new insight. Uh, into the human condition, the sorrow of the human condition, and yet in that comes our greatness, too, if we can manage it. Now, what about religion? Uh, the Greeks, and, and, and in, 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 when they, if they were able to sort of really weep for Heracles or Oedipus or the Persians, had achieved an ecstasy a stepping outside of themselves, of their normal selves, just as our Paleolithic ancestors who went into that cave, into that darkness, uh, threading their way through these dangerous, frightening labyrinths, and to create that beauty down there, had achieved a stepping outside of their normal existence too, that somehow makes marks the human being. But so often hum religion is so often used, as we know, to embed us in uh, the, the state that we actually are, that, uh, to give us a sense of self-congratulation. And instead of uh, uh, encouraging us to go beyond ourselves in love for all, it makes us draw in and say, you know, we alone are the, are the holy ones. And yet, um, all of them begin, in some sense, with the perception that ex life is suffering. That's the first noble truth of Buddhism. Existence is dukkha. Uh, it's often translated, existence is suffering. But uh, there's some th a better translation is existence is all right. Life is all right. There's always something wrong. You, you know, you fall in love with somebody and soon, you know, the fly enters the ointment. Uh, or, uh, you know, you get a wonderful new job, but you know the other candidates are disappointed. Uh, there's, uh, 
you know, our, our beauty, such as it is, fades. We become old, we become sick, we become tired. Uh, nothing lasts for long, and yet we have this vision, the imagination to see how things can be and create alternative worlds, as, as the Greeks did in their tragedy. Uh, but, it, it, but it is hard, it requires hard work. When I was a child, uh, at eight years old, I learned this definition of God in the Roman Catholic Catechism. The answer, question was, what is God? And the answer, quick as a flash, with no sort of perturbation at all, came, God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Now, I have to say at eight, that didn't mean much to me. And I still find it a rather arid and pompous definition, but I also believe that now that it's incorrect. It's incorrect in thinking that it's possible simply to draw breath and define a word that literally means to set limits upon a reality that must go beyond everything we can think and know. Now, in the 10th century before Christ, this would have been just about the time that people were stopping visiting the caves in Lascaux. But in India, uh, 10th century BCE, uh, the people of India, the Brahmin priests of India, developed uh, uh, another competition. They were also Aryans, like the Greeks. They loved competitions, uh, a sacred competition. And the object of the competition was to find a way to define or, or to formulate in words the Brahman, the ultimate Hindu reality. The Brahman goes beyond speech. Uh, you can't pray to Brahman because Brahman is you. Brahman is being itself. Um, you can't say what Brahman is because Brahman it, it means the all. It is everything that is. Something that our minds cannot conceive. And yet they were setting out to define the Brahman. So they would begin, uh, the priests, before they began their competition, by going off into the jungle for a retreat. And they were taking themselves away from ordinary life, putting themselves in a different frame of mind, just as uh, the old ways of thinking were cast aside in the utter darkness of the Lascaux Caves. And... Uh, they would fast, they would do breathing exercises that put the chain, mind changing exercises, and then they would return. And the challenger would use all his poetry, insight, immense learning to try to encapsulate what he meant by Brahman. And the others would listen. And then they would have to respond to that, build upon it with their learning. But the person who uh, won was the priest who reduced all the others to silence. And in that silence, the Brahman was present. The Brahman was not present in the wordy definitions or declarations, but it was Brahman was present in the stunning realization of the impotence of speech. And that is what I feel theology should be. Uh, it's the same, it's repeating in the same way that extremity that I saw this morning in the, in, with, with the painters pushing us into a new mode of, uh, of seeing. Or music which you can't define, but which has an extraordinary effect on you. It is beyond words. And poetry, which takes um, uh, language into a state where there, there is, where, to an extremity, where you are facing a silence. You know at the end of the symphony, at, in a concert hall, uh, when the last notes die away, there is often a pregnant, very full beat of silence until the applause begins. And good theology should help us to live in that moment of silence. Uh, not answering our questions, but leading us there. The medievals let's, uh, ha, used to call that intellectus. They said we have ratio in our minds. 
And there is that moment in our minds where we tip over into unknowing and transcendence, and that is what they call the intellectus. Um, and many of the Jewish, Christian, Muslim theologians uh, attempted their own versions of the Brahmodya competition. Maimonides, for example, the great Jewish philosopher, said that we really cannot say that God exists because what we know of existence is far too limited to apply to God. God is not existing like you or me or this podium or even the atom. This is another kind of being reality altogether. Uh, and Thomas Aquinas, who is often thought to have proved the existence of God in five proofs, um, he's really doing uh, a 13th century new scientific mo version of the Brahmogya. He begins by taking, the, and it's important to notice that he's not afraid of science. He is taking the philosophy of Aristotle at a time when it was very iffy to uh, use Aristotle. Aristotle was, after all, a pagan who sacrificed to idols. And he's also learning from Maimonides and from uh, Muslim uh, philosophers like Ibn Sina at the time of the Crusades, when some of his contemporaries uh, were happy to kill Jews and Muslims in the name of God. He's willing to learn from them. And in the new scientific speech of the 13th century, he takes these proofs of Aristotle and Ibn Sina and others and says, points out quite in quite a perfunctory way uh, that God is the necessary being, uh, God is the ultimate excellence, God is the first cause, the prime mover, and he proves it. And at the end of each of his proofs, he said, and that is quod omnes dicunt deum, uh, which can be translated roughly as that's the kind of thing that people have mean when they say God. And it all seems done and dusted, five proofs, therefore that quod, that's God. And then he pulls the rug out from under our feet. And he says, but we do not know what we've proved. What we've proved is the existence of a mystery. We have no notion what a necessary being can be. Uh, this is not, nothing like any being that we know comes from something else. This is, uh, this is a being we cannot imagine what such a being can be. And leaves you breathless. His contemporary, uh, Bonaventure, uh, Franciscan who took the life of Christ very seriously but modeled his whole life on the following of Christ uh, also says Christ is the word and we see in Christ this word that God has spoken and we can then see what God can be like and then there comes the crucifixion and the word is silenced again leading us into unknowing um, and every sentence of the Quran is called an ayah, a parable, an allegory, uh, because we can only speak about God in terms of signs and symbols. Even the great symbols of the paradise or the last judgment, these are ayat, they're allegories. Uh, we can't talk about God straight. Um, Ibn, the great uh, Sufi theologian, Ibn Arabi, said that the creative imagination was the way to God. Uh, we had a duty uh, to look into, each one of us, he said, is a unique and unrepeatable uh, word that God has spoken to the world. Each of us is an incarnation of one of God's hidden names. And that's a sort of an exercise which you're meant to do. Think all of us in this room, each of us being an unrepeatable and unique revelation of God. And then you think of all the people who've lived and who have lived and who, God willing, will live after us. And you realize it's impossible to define what God itself is. And he said our duty is to create theophanies for ourselves by using the creative imagination to look past the frequently unpromising exterior to the sacred word that's been spoken in each one of us and see each 
person we meet as an epiphany. It's what Hindus do when they uh, bow and, and to one another to acknowledge the divinity they are encountering with the other. And again, um, the religions have all stressed what those Bushmen uh, uh, understood, what the Greeks understood, that religion should lead to tenderness and empathy. It's not that they're all the same. They're not all the same. My life as a relig historian of religion would be a great deal easier if all the religions were the same. Uh, they are not. They are extraordinarily different. Each has fascinating differences and significant, important differences. Each has its own particular genius. Each its special flaws or failings. Uh, but what they do all say is that there's something wrong with your religion if it doesn't issue in compassion. I can have faith that moves mountains, says St. Paul. I can give my body to be burned. I can give all that I have to the poor, but if I lack charity, it will do me no good at all. Uh, not one of you can be a disciple, said the Prophet Muhammad, unless he desires for his neighbor what he desires for himself. When Confucius was asked by his disciples, Master, which of your teachings can we put into practice all day and every day? He said, Shu, likening to the self. Do not do to others what you would not like them to do to you. Look into your own heart. Discover what gives you pain. And then refuse, if you can, uh, to inflict that pain under any circumstance on anybody else. The golden rule, which each of the great faiths has developed. And notice Confucius said all day and every day. I don't know about in Holland, but we have, we often say in England when we've done something nice for somebody, we say, well, that's my good deed for the day. As though we can then return for the next 23 hours uh, to our ordinary lives of spite and conceit and greed and unkindness. Uh, no, all day and every day. And if you did that all day and every day, you would be in a state of ecstasis, uh, stepping outside the ego, which holds us back from the divine. And the, 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 they, all the faiths, too, put suffering at the top of their agenda. Because even our enemies suffer. Uh, look at Pakistan right now, the pain that is going on. But each single person that we meet has a private history of pain. And that is, again, something we should remember when we say we don't like that person. Think of that person's pain. Uh, the French philosopher Abelard used to say uh, that uh, he didn't like the... Uh, uh, Anselmian uh, view of uh, the uh, atonement. But he would say that uh, we look at the crucifix, at an image of flayed human beings, an image of the pain that human beings inflict upon one another, and our heart breaks. And it is that act of compassion that saves us. That is what saves us, when our hearts are broken open with uh, empathy and sorrow at another's pain. What happened? We started uh, with Newton in the West to think that we could prove what God was. And we started, and then the churches took it up. And we started to think that we could say what God was and reduced God to a sort of scientific explanation. And we forced God into an, the religious idiom into an idiom that uh, was not where it was not at ease. And that has made uh, religion very difficult for us to understand uh, because often we use our vocabulary, that questions like words that in English in any way, but like belief or. Um, um, uh, mystery uh, we don't get it. it they meant something different uh, in the Greek Orthodox tradition uh, an icon 
uh, a religious icon that expresses the internal uh, meaning of a doctrine, such as Andre Rublev's uh, uh, image of the of the Trinity. The new, it's called the Old Testament Trinity. Often, this is seen as as authoritative as Scripture. Art can tell us uh, how how to go to God, and also. Uh, Often our religions, just like our secular ideologies, can harden our hearts against the other and give us a sense of righteousness. Uh, whereas the trick uh, for f to be fully humane is to have that tenderness that the Bushmen have for their animal, that the Greeks had uh, when uh, they wept for Oedipus or that we should have when we look at uh, the suffering, not only of the flayed Christ on the crucifix, but on, at our fellow human beings. Thank you.